the best part of my job right here, right now, the delivery. <laughs> oh, that's the car we've been dreaming about. Yes. Where's that? Kind of a pretty car, isn't it? Oh, man. <laughs> Beautiful car. Yes. You know, this little GTX was quite a project for us. I knew that we were in for something in the beginning, but I couldn't see everything. I just kind of expected the worst, and it was even worse than that. They're coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master, Mark Warman. Joined by his out of this world cousin, Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. His apprentice and daughter, Alyssa. Whoa, whoa, stop. And his childhood best friend, Royal. Mark hates everybody. His protege painter, Will Scott. You got one job. This is Graveyard Cars. So going back a few seasons ago when the car first arrived, I wanted to walk around it with Alyssa. It was a great teaching subject to say how easy it is to hide sins. And boy, that car had its share of sins. Looking in this trunk, at a glance, it looks like, hey, that trunk's not bad. I can't see daylight through it like I can on a lot of the other cars. But when you look closer, yeah. there's a hole. As Alyssa and I went around the car, you could see that Outwardly, things look great, like the trunk floor. It was beautiful, it was blue, it looked good. You hit that thing with a tool and it'll punch right through it because it was all fiberglass. When I talk about sins that are hidden, I'm talking exactly about this car. When you look at it in the beginning, in the original photos that I bought it, it was beautiful, it looked great. Even when it showed up, it looked great. But underneath all of that, it's kind of like that phrase in building a house that the carpet hides a multitude of sins like rotten floors. Well, in this case, paint hides a multitude of sins, like rotten floors. Every single thing on this car had filler on it from front to back. Now on the quarter panels and the roof, same things. They looked good on the outside, but as soon as you started chiseling away, you saw there was no meat underneath it. The metal was gone. The car basically was sculpted from Bondo. Yeah. Bubble's never just a bubble. It's okay. always a sign of rust underneath things. Okay? Not just a bad Same paint thing job. there. No, it usually starts way down low. Okay. So the Bondo, the filler that they used on the roof came up through and was beginning to bubble through the paint. I've learned a lot over the years working with my dad. I found this build really interesting because it shows you how much damage and rust you can hide under filler and paint. Even the door jams on this car were filled with Bondo. They were sculptured. It looked like they had sculptured in what would be the quarter seam, but there was no quarter seam. It was just made out of filler. Kudos to the guy that did the filler work on it. You have a job at Graveyard Cars if you ever need one. Nice work. Just should start over a little better substrate. I'm sorry, I shouldn't use words like that. You should start with better metal. When you're speaking about validating a car to make sure that it's real and that it's a numbers matching, in this case, we've got a 69B body. All right, it's a Plymouth GTX. There are two hidden body numbers on this car. We've talked about it many times in the show. One is underneath where the weather strip goes on the trunk lip. It'll be the last eight characters of the vehicle identification number. That same number appears on the upper tie bar. These are both weld-in panels, and they're both relatively hidden. Back in the old days, before people knew about the hidden body numbers, if they were just to steal the dash out of one car and put it in another one, or do some kind of a hokey rebody for whatever reason, those numbers would scream at you something was wrong. In the case of our GTX, while they were beat to death and while it had had work done on the core support, it looked to me like somebody had cut it, rolled the core support out of the way to get the engine out of it, and then rolled it back over and welded it up. Whatever the reason, at least the original body numbers were there. Look at that frame rail right there. Yep. You come along here and it seems like it's bad. That's because it is bad. Education complete. 
So in the metal replacement on this car, I would put in the top 2% of all of the graveyard cars that we've done as far as the amount of metal. There was so much, we didn't even have time to film it. We, we couldn't have. It would be a, an entire season-long car when you talk about the metal. So with this particular car, when we got it back from the dipper, they delivered dust. It was just metal shavings. That was all that was left of this car. You're talking. The front inner fenders, obviously the front fenders had to be replaced too. The hood had to be replaced. The upper cowl panel and firewall had patches put into them. Both doors were garbage. We had to get new doors for it from Auto Metal Direct. The floor, the step wells, the under seat pan, the trunk pan, the inner and outer wheelhouses, the Dutchman panel, Dutchman panel support, trunk hinge supports, rear body panel, quarter panels, drip rails, roof skin. Uh, what else am I possibly forgetting here? I feel like my cousin Benny when he's rattling off all the things that he says to Marissa to me, could you possibly dump more on my head? I don't know, could you? Nate he puts his hand, that's a cute movie. She looks smoking. The point is that there was a lot of metal that needed to be replaced on this car. I think we even had to do the trunk lid. So when it came time to build it, we had to replace everything. When you have to replace everything, you gotta paint everything too. You know, it's when the quarters are off, it's doing the sound deadener from front to back and then painting it from front to back. First statement, B5 is my favorite color. For real? For real. It's, why is it, that contradicts everything. Panther pink. Uh, so B5 blue, Mark has asked me to say on camera, it's one of my favorite colors. It's truly not. We've done that color a hundred times. It is a gorgeous color. I'm just not a big fan of blue. There's nothing I like about it. I like green, I like pink, I hate blue. You, you want me to be dishonest on camera, and I'm not gonna do that for everybody at home. Talk about how fun it is to build a formula. So one of the problems we have today is these questions are not very really accurate. Making these colors, it's not fun. You know, you go to the computer, you print the label how much you want to make, then you go right into the mixing room, double check your toners, make sure you have everything, which it's hit and miss because it requires so much when you make three gallons. Because three gallons, that's actually six gallons sprayable. So like right off the bat, we got a, you know, we got a metallic toner here. Right after that, takes a second metallic. Then jumps over with the blue, but we're not done. It gets another blue. So you're looking at like seven, eight colors between the silvers, and the blues and the greens that pick, go together just to get B5 blue. And when you mix three gallons of color, it takes a good hour and a half. I don't like mixing color. That's why I have entrusted Noah in doing it moving forward because he's a great helper. So basically, I go into paint, there's three gallons, unreduced, ready to go. Horrible questions. Yeah, gosh. B5 is a very transparent color probably a little more transparent than most. It takes extra coats to cover. So you're looking at probably about five coats and then two drop coats. And when I say the drop coats is what I'm getting at is you're painting the car, but you're painting it in a different direction. That way it prevents the, uh, the metallic from not laying out correctly. Do those drop coats, the metallic lays out even, and it looks great. So just like every other car we do, you have to cut and buff it. I've always done my own cut and buffs for as far back as I can remember. It takes me about a week to do a complete car. And then you find yourself when it's in the booth and you're buffing it, really just spend even more time because, hey, you're the painter. You want that, the more you buff, the richer it looks, the shinier it looks, you want every squirrel out. It just takes a lot of time. So having somebody to assist me in that process now is a lifesaver. You know, so we'll start with 800, 1200, 2000, 3000, and then you start to buff it. When you have to do the blackouts on the hood and the rockers, because they go a flat color, you really ought to make sure, especially those areas, are buffed out to perfection. Because once you do the blackout, it's extremely hard to try to go back and do any touch-up buffing. Because if you hit that flat black that I've painted with a buffer, it'll make it shiny. And then you're having to redo all the flat black that you did. So it's just a little more, little more patience, a little more attention to the detail on that final buff to make sure it looks perfect. So when it came time to do the stripes and the rockers, they have a kit that's called Hot Rod Black. You just mix it, it's ready to go. 
You mask everything off, double check your measurements. Luckily, we have a lot of cars here, so you can just go out to the graveyard, take original measurements, and then do the markings on the GTX of where the stripes are supposed to go. You take that hot rod black, it's a single stage. You let it dry overnight. Don't try to rush it, because if you rush it, it's blotchy here and it doesn't look right. So just give it time to dry. It dries a nice, natural, flat finish and it looks amazing. In the world of factory mistakes, which we've talked about several times on Graveyard Cars, this one takes the cake. All right, I've had numbers transposed. I've had the wrong character in the VIN for the engine. We've got a 69 Hemi Charger RT that doesn't have the famous J code in the fifth position of the vehicle identification number, which is the most important one. You know it's a real car, but it's a factory mistake. But this one took the cake, so much so I even had Tony D'Agostino from Tony's Mopar Parts come out with me on that episode. I had him read through the vehicle identification number that was stamped onto the block and the one that was stamped into the transmission. What they should be, this is an early 69 car, so they should be the full vehicle identification number and it should match the full vehicle identification number on the dash, on the title, on the radiator support, and on the trunk lip. It didn't. This, have you ever seen anything quite like that? Uh, no. Not quite like that. Well, it's a full VIN. It's a full vehicle identification uh, number. But it's a full VIN for a 3D3 Super B. So first thing you're sitting at home is thinking, well, then it's got the wrong engine and transmission. I don't think so. What we had was a 440 Super Commando engine, as it should be, standard on all GTXs. The vehicle identification number that was stamped into it was from a 1969 Dodge Super B. Yet the sequence number of that vehicle identification number matched the car. So it was the first, I think, six characters that were completely from another car that were stamped into this engine and transmission. It's obviously not a 383. And when you read that vehicle identification number, F says H code, which is a 383. So it gets a little confusing. If you go back and watch that episode, you'll see where we break down the, the VIN on that car and how it all works. But basically somebody took half of the vehicle identification number on the assembly line, stamped it into the engine off of a Super B, and then the rest of it was a series number for the actual GTX. It was absolutely fascinating. Even to this day, it is one of the most fascinating mistakes I've ever seen, and Tony would agree with that. Again, I, I can't see any motivation for this. This is a freak. It's, it's just it's a, a freak. It's a freak, it really is. The guy on the assembly line could have been drinking. It's always possible, or he could have been in a hurry, or just plain not paying attention. Did you guys see my T-shirt? Nakatomi Christmas party. <laughs> so that goes back to the whole yippee ki bad word thing. And Hans, Hans Gruber, he was a bad man. Uh, yes, what is that you said? Uh, yippee marfa. I don't think they have to, to, to bleep marfa. I paint hood and deck lids off so that way I don't have any tape lines. Um, when you paint them on, sometimes you'll get kind of a fuzzy edge. So I found it's better take the hood off, the deck lid off, mask at the bottom of the trunk jams, and then mask at the bottom of the fenders. That way you can get color all the way down and it looks factory and you can't tell anybody's been there. So this particular customer wanted a GYC logo on the deck lid with Mark's signature, which makes no sense because Mark didn't do anything to the car. He just kind of paid for parts, paid us to build the car. I don't, don't know why it wasn't mine, but whatever. So just to save time, I had a stencil made up, Graveyard Cars logo, Mark's signature, laid the stencil down over the blue. I tried three or four different colors of pearl, which one would look nice, a white, a blue, a red. This customer chose the blue, so it really gives it that ghost effect sprayed the pearl on it, removed the decal, then cleared the whole deck lid. A couple of extra coats of clear right there so you can not uh, cut and buff it flat. You can't tell it's been masked off. Looks great, customer loves it. And like I said, you can just kind of catch it in the right light, but still should have been my signature. The undercoating process we do on 90% of our cars depends what the fender tag says, if it's supposed to get it or it's not. So what we'll do is once the car is completely buffed, looks amazing, all the paintwork is done, 
take it out, pressure wash it, give it a really good bath, get all that compound out of there, because if it's left on there, it gets hard as a rock. Get the car cleaned, bring it back into the paint booth, mask the whole entire car, and then at that point, I'll undercoat it. We have a great system that we use, very easy, low maintenance, smells horrible. Let that sit a couple days in the booth, kick it over to assembly, and then at that point, we take it off the Whirly jig and throw it on a bin pack. We have a Dell pin right here. Yep, and that's gonna go in this reservoir? Correct. I love working with Alyssa. She helped me assemble this 440 engine. She came in with her fresh nails done, and I'll tell you what, I was so impressed. I think she did a better job than I did with these long nails on. I don't know how she did it. Look, my dad didn't tell me that I was gonna be working with Doug. So I went and got my nails done, and I got them done the way that I like them, which is a little bit long. And boy, did the keyboard commandos go off on that. Watch your fingers. Powerful. There it is. Great. I love working with Alyssa. She really pays attention. She does a great job. She's a great helper. She's very smart. This is the first complete build out I've ever done on an engine, and there are a lot of parts. You know, I love working with Doug. He's such a great teacher. He's so patient and kind, and he never treats me like I'm stupid, even when I ask stupid questions. Are we getting close to being done? <laughs> I feel like we were like moving so quick. It's been so easy so far. So I really appreciate that. And you know, anytime I have a chance to work with Doug, I definitely take it. You know, he's not full of insults or put downs like other people. Who are you talking about, Alyssa? Nobody in particular. So we got the engine done, came out great. Alyssa did a great job. And uh, it was so much fun explaining all this to Alyssa. I'll always remember this as my first engine build. And the best part is, I got to work with family. When we first got our easy run engine stands, we ran all of our engines. It was great. You go back to earlier seasons, you saw us do that a lot. Then we got so busy that we got away from it. And I think our egos were writing checks that our bodies couldn't cash. Top Gun, 1986, I think. Point being, we would put an engine in a car in the rear main seal would leak, valve covers would leak, freeze plug it, seep. I mean, we're good at what we do, but there's a lot of moving components when it comes to an engine. Bottom line was, we were having to pull engines back out again. So I dropped the moratorium on any of that stuff. No more does an engine go in a car that hasn't been ran on the engine run stand. So this little engine had to be ran on the engine run stand before we could install it in the car. That sounds good. Yeah, it does. Just ran out of gas. Why'd you let it run out of gas, Dougie? I don't know. You know, I never understood why you only put one ounce in there. <laughs> Many seasons ago, we restored this gorgeous R4 Red 1969 Dodge Charger Daytona for our friend Tom Partridge. What color is the 440 Magnum engine painted? Is it turquoise, hemi orange, corporate blue. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I will let you know how you did. All right, ghouls, welcome back. How did you do on that one? What color from the factory was the 440 Magnum in our 69 Charger Daytona? If you said corporate blue, you are absolutely wrong. It was Hemi Orange. 69 to 70 was Hemi Orange with, I believe, a few 71s. Corporate blue on the high performance engines didn't start showing up until late 1970. And the turquoise, that was 68 and earlier. This was one of the funnest builds we did at Graveyard Cars because it truly was a basket case when we started. But when we were all done, this car was beautiful. Like new from the front to the back and the top to the bottom. Now, one thing that I pride myself on is being transparent with our audience. When we start an engine up, we haven't pre-started it. I know that this happens a lot in the Hollywood world and in the car show world, because they don't want to look bad. I don't care if I look bad. I just want you to see what we deal with. 
The reason I point out the painted manifolds is this. When we finish assembling an engine, when Doug is all done assembling an engine and the pieces that are supposed to be painted engine color are on it, we don't start it at that point. We send it down to Will. He takes a month and a half to paint an engine that should take the average guy a day. When that engine comes back from Will, it's painted from one end to the other, including the exhaust manifolds. That's the way the factory did it. You may not like it on keyboard commando, but that's the way they did it. We put it on the engine run stand, and after about five minutes, those manifolds start getting up to 400 and 500 degrees. It bakes that paint off of there. So when I'm pointing it out that we're not faking that, we're showing you the paint is burning off for the very first time. That's because the engine is running for the very first time. So if there's a failure, we share it with you. We don't cut. Hey, that's leaking. Hey, this. We've had engines rattle when we fired them up. We've had them drip a little bit, valve cover leaks. We've even had one or two in the past that we filmed that had rear main seals leaking in them. But the point is show everything. Let the audience see what you have to go through to be able to put one of these cars together. So the car had an eight and three quarter rear end. And one of my jobs is to completely dismantle, restore, and reassemble the entire rear end and leaf springs. Part of the process is to water blast the components, clean them, and then satin clear. And then wheel paints the housing. And then I just reassemble everything according to the way it came apart. Okay, so all I have to do is put the third member back in with a new fresh gasket and sealer, and that'll be ready to go. Great, just like that. I replaced the axle tags with new ones from Dante's Mopar. Now I'm gonna install the backing plates, and this car is optioned with front discs, so I'm gonna put 10-inch rear drums on this car. After I have the backing plates installed, I'm gonna go ahead and put the axles in with new bearings on them. So the axle flanges hold the axles and the new bearings and the backing plates all in place in the three-quarter housing. Next, I install the parking brake cables through the backing plates to the brake shoes. So now that I have the axles and backing plates on, I can put the wheel cylinders on. So then I install the secondary brake shoe on the back, and this is where I attach the parking brake cable. So now I have the primary brake shoe installed. Being this is a 69 model car, it has self-adjusting rear brakes, and the adjustment of this is critical if it is to work correctly. The last thing I'm gonna put on here are the new rear brake drums. Put the leaf springs on, secure them with two U-bolts on each side and four U-bolt nuts on each side also. The front leaf spring hangers go on next, and on the rear, we put on the shackles. So basically, it's all ready to go in the car now. Okay, cut. Cut. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> yeah! Putting the cars together, as I've said many times, we have a standard formula for it. Because the way the cars will sit on the lift and the way that the weight is distributed, if we don't put the rear axle assembly in first, it'll be very nose heavy if we were to do the drivetrain. So we always install that axle. I'm gonna guess it's around four or 500 pounds, but it's enough to keep the back end of that car settled down. Leaf springs, leaf spring purchase shackles, put the shocks together on it. Next thing you know, that area is done and we can move to the front. Ready? Ready. Ooh, golly, they don't get any lighter, do they? <laughs> no, <Nope>, never. <laughs> Once you have all the provisions in place, it is just a matter of making sure the alignment is good. It's very tight, and this is where things can happen. You can scratch an inner fender with a valve cover or exhaust manifold, or if they happen to leave the uh, dipstick indicator in place, those get bent. The name of the game is to line everything up and go slow. 
Once you have the K member seated up against the frame rail, you can install the bolts. In this case, it went together really smooth. Same thing for the transmission cross member, lined right up where it's supposed to, put the four bolts and the nuts that hold the transmission cross member in, and that's done. One of the next things we do is install the torsion bars. So for the record, it's a 780 and a 781 are the last three characters of the torsion bars for this particular car because it's got hemi suspension, but that doesn't matter. Once that is done, we can raise the lower control arm up to meet the upper control arm, and then that ball joint's what fastens those together. Make that connection, put the bolt in there, tighten it down, and we got it. When all those things are bolted together, the last thing is the shocks. You have to have the car down on the ground to be able to put them on, but you guide them up in the hole at the same time. I love the stance on this car. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's so second day. The owner really wanted that. He, he grew up in the same era. Well, he's older than I am. But we did grow up in the era where every single car on the road had Kragers on it. He wanted Kragers. I wasn't born back in the day, is what we call it here. I was born after the fact. So all the cool things that my dad talks about, I wasn't there for, and I generally don't even know what he's talking about. But one thing that I do know, and I have seen with my own eyes, is the beautiful Krager wheels and BF Goodrich tires. If I had a car back in the day, that would be my choice. So what we ended up going with, for you guys at home that like this stance too, it is a 15 by eight inch wide standard offset Krager Classic five spoke on the back, and a 15 by seven standard offset Krager Classic on the front. The tire on the rear is a 27560 BF Goodrich TA radial. The one on the front is a 245 BF Goodrich TA radial. Thanks to our friends over at 1010 Tire. Oh, that's a gratuitous plug. We'll leave it in. Oh, you think I can crap tires out? I had the task of final assembly. This car was really fun to put together. Every little thing that you add to this car really makes it start to pop. One of the things I really love about this car is on the sides of the quarters, it has the really big call out of the GTX emblem on the side. It's just really cool and in your face. Being a GTX, this car has a lot of chrome trim and accents on it, but one of the best parts about it is the beauty plate that goes on the back of the trunk. Just the beauty plate in the back and the chrome taillight bezels really just sets the back end of this car off. Oh man, these flashbacks always get me. I never took a lot of behind the scenes pictures, but when I get to go back and watch a few seasons ago, a few episodes ago, it's like a big photo album for me. Putting the headliner in the 69 GTX, it's my buddy Larry. And I, and I just, it really always touches me. He did such a phenomenal job. You know, aside from the fact that he's just a really good hard guy, he really did a great job. And these are difficult. If you've ever done a headliner, they are difficult. There is so much pulling and stretching to get them tight everywhere. Because a lot of times you'll see these cars at a car show where the center area is just tight as a drum. Because that's easy. You just grab in there, pull, it's tight. But then the reverse curves, where it goes down on the inside sail panels or up around where the visors mount, that'll have wrinkles in it. Larry's never did. They were always spot on perfect. Over the years, you see our dash assemblies that we used to do in-house, and now we sublet out to Instrument Specialties. You've seen the evolution of them. When we get one back from Instrument Specialties, it's like a big piece of jewelry. It's like a work of art. Well, that is absolutely stunning as always. Oh, thank you. My gosh. Every conceivable detail is handled on these dash assemblies. It was nice on this particular case, if you go back and watch the episode, we had Mike out from Instrument Specialties to hang out for a week. And I picked his brain because I like to learn things. And I learned a lot about the photochemical process. What he doesn't do on his instrumentation is he doesn't order a decal and just put it on there. Now, you can do that. And if you're doing a car at home and you're working on a budget, that's probably the way to do it. But if you're doing a top-notch car, you want to duplicate that photochemical process. That's what he does. He takes the original plastic work out and he has it chromed and then does the blackout rather than buying the new reproduction pieces for it. That element of detail is throughout it. Whether it's hand scribbling an initial on the back of a Hamtramck 69 Plymouth glove box, or whether it's detailing the lettering, the raised lettering for wipers and light indicators, everything is done on these dashes to perfection. So it isn't the cheapest in the world, but it is, I believe, in my heart of hearts, it's the best in the world.
In a previous season of Graveyard Cars, we restored this stunning 1968 Plymouth GTX 440 Super Commando for the World Wrestling Champion Bill Goldberg. True or false, the transmission behind that 440 Super Commando was an automatic. If you think you remember the episode, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, folks, welcome back. How did we do on that one? Graveyard Cars aficionados. Did Mr. Goldberg's 1968 GTX convertible have an automatic transmission? If you said true, you're a liar and a fat mouth. <laughs> well, that or you don't remember it. His car was a factory four speed, one of the most rare cars we've done at Graveyard Cars. In addition to that, it was QQ1 Blue. It was a two tone blue interior, featured the 375 horsepower Super Commando. It was a power convertible top and factory rally steering wheel. After I get the carpet installed and everything's cut uh, exactly where it needs to be, I can move forward and put the quarter trim panels on there. After I get those in there, I can set the back seat. So I got to help install the interior in this car and it had white door panels and I really love that because my car had white door panels also. What's really fun about this is Mark actually tracked down my interior panels out of my Barracuda from back in the day when I was 18 years old. The car was a factory four-speed, one of only 164 318 four-speed 70 grand coupes, 164 in the entire world. This car was lemon twist yellow, FY1, it had an A62 rally instrument cluster with it, overhead console at C26. This car was white leather interior. Not only did my car have the white door panels, but I also had white leather bucket seats, and I also had a Hearst pistol grip four-speed. Beautiful, stunning car. Doug traded that car off for a 1970 Ford van because it overheated on him one day. That's in a whole nother story I'll tell you later. I looked for the car afterwards. We saw it one time, it had been painted black. The whole interior had been changed out to black. We saw it down in Crestwall at a mill, sawmill. That was the last time we ever saw that car. So that was circa 1981. Until about 20 years ago, I went out to buy an engine from a guy out in Veneta. He says, I got a 340 in here if you want to take a look at that. So we walk into the garage and there is a completely chromed out 340 sitting on an engine stand. I'm looking at that and I say, you know, that looks like Doug's old engine. Everything was chrome on it, man. That 340 wouldn't get out of its own way, but it was sure a good looking setup. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, this came out of a 70 Barracuda. I said, oh, cool. He says, I just sold it to a guy. Oh, cool. Where'd that go? He says, oh, it's out in Springfield somewhere. He says, it was cool because it was a 318 four-speed. Mm -hmm. 318 four-speed? What else? Well, he says it was painted black, but it looked like it was yellow. Oh my gosh, it was Doug's old car had surfaced. He says, you see those door panels over there? And here was a pile of interior trim panels in white. Grand coupe with the wood grain going through them. Those are out of that car. So I talked to the guy and I said, can I have them? He said, yeah, you could have them. He has kept these panels all these years and we still have them here today, 40 something years later. Now, before the guys can put the dash assembly in these cars, you have to put all the things that fasten to the firewall in first. So if it's a non-air conditioning car, you just have a heater box. In this case, it's an air conditioning, so you have an entire suitcase that bolts into place. The pedals have to be into place. All of the things that would go into the dash would be really difficult to do once that dash is in, have to go in first. That also includes the firewall installation. Once all the provisions are in on the firewall, you can go ahead and install that dash. I like it. Long time waiting. Installing the steering column is always kind of nerve wracking because you have to feed the entire column down to the steering box, line up the splines correctly, get this driven down all the way to where you can drive the roll pin through without scratching anything. With any build, even on our GTX, even though it's been a long time coming, the best part is always the final assembly. Justin's got the best job in the house. You're just bringing this car back to life and while it has been on track to come back to life, it's never more evident than when you start putting all of those pieces on. 
The owners of this vehicle were really sweet, really patient. They're just really awesome folks. And so I'm so excited to see how happy they are to get their car back. And even though this car was a mess when we got it, we've brought it back to life the right way. Hey there, I'm Mark Warman. Whenever I come back to Oregon, I visit my old neighborhood of Springfield. A lot of the guys I worked with still hang out there. And even though I am an actor, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a car guy. When I was growing up in Springfield, car guys were all over the place. And because I wanted to be just like them, I was treated with respect. I remember there was Troy and Roy, the Lockwood twins. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. What's up? What's up? And there was Tony, Philly Steak D'Agostino. We had Johnny One Ball. I told you, I got two. It's only the one that works. And there was Cue Ball Morton. Yeah, I prefer Kojak. Who loves you, baby? Ah, uh, there was Steroid Floyd. Hey, Mark. Good to see ya. How much you bench these days? We had Run DCC. He got that name because he always ran the clear coat. Hey, it was cold in the booth, okay? Get off my back. There was upsetting Eddie. He got that name because he would whisper something to you to draw you in. Huh? What was that? And then scream. I know, Whoa. right? Okay. Uh-huh. There was the car thief. She got that name taking cars with low miles out for a joyride. Will told me it was okay. Get over it, Dad. And there was Susie. Why did I marry this guy in the first place, Warman? Oh, hi, Mark. Just looking for a pet groomer for Bailey. There was cross-thread Ted. How was I supposed to know it was metric? And of course, there was me, the ice tray, the ice man, ice cube, ice shavings, ice pick, icy hot, icy you, you see me, icicle, ice pops, ice cold. This was a fun unveiling for us because it was the first time in a long time that we actually delivered the car to the customer. I used to do that quite a bit up in Gentleman in Canada. I used to do cars for him. We would deliver the car up to him, usually meet him at the border or something. This case, we got to drive up to Salem, which is only an hour from here, and unveil this gorgeous, stunning, all numbers matching 1969 Plymouth GTX. I knew that the owners were waiting at their house patiently for us. They knew we were coming up, but I didn't want to spoil it and let them see the car while it was on the rollback. So we parked down around the corner, unloaded the car, did the final wipe downs on it, made sure everything was clean, the bugs were off it because we went up there on our rollback. The other thing is it gave us an opportunity to start the car, warm it up, go around the block, make sure <laughs> Murphy's Law, everything was working like it's supposed to. Then we were able to make the final approach to the driveway that led to their house. I'm not the kind of guy that likes a lot of attention, but it is so rewarding to return a car like this to its Ooh. customers, Ron and <laughs> Debbie West. They are so deserving of this car after all these years to have such a beautiful car back in their family. Oh, that's the car we've been dreaming about. Yeah. All right, it's yeah. Kind of a pretty car, isn't it? <laughs> oh, man. Yes. Beautiful car. Got a nice rumble to it. That'll make the neighbors happy. <laughs> well, you've been along for the whole plight. Yep. This car has never been a big fan of mine. Like some people are fans of mine. I don't think it was ever a fan. It really made me it kind of fought jump you. through the hoops every time I turn around. It was something. It and was so fighting you a little bit. It was. But it you was. You got there. I did. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, this car I've talked about was a, a pain in the rear for us. Well, it had a ton of metal that needed to be replaced on it. It also had a lot of Murphy's Law that we talk about, things that you put the quarter on it, you put the new inner structure on it, you put it all together, 
you bring the car over, you put the window assembly in it, and for some reason the quarter's out just a little bit or in just a little bit. Next thing you know, you're redoing that section. All that stuff is pre-fit now. We don't have those problems, but this goes back three or four years ago, and that's just a valuable lesson. I want to take a personal moment and thank Ron and Debbie for their incredible patience and kindness throughout our way long build and never got upset with us, never treated us badly. And I knew he was really dying to get the car. So first, thank you guys. Like you said, this is a gentleman's muscle car. That's muscle right, car. right, right. It's not the one that you're gonna go drag racing in. Nope. But it's gonna go nicely pretty... down the road and sound yeah. good. But that 440 runs hard. And if some punk weaselly little kid pulls up in a five liter Mustang, you don't hesitate to show him what's under the hood. I promise you won't have any trouble. All right. at all. There you go. When I was able to present the car to them, they're not the kind of people that are gonna do cartwheels up and down the driveway. Neither am I anymore, but they are the kind of people that you can read like a book and they just love this car, absolutely. You could see it in their eyes, their eyes lit up and Ron was like a kid. He couldn't wait to get out to it and start checking it out. So with the nice weather, what's the plan? Maybe a little later, take it out. Oh little, yeah. Little break Definitely. in, run, I see what's going around. on. driving around. Yep. Go show some people. And Right after we left, I did get a phone call that he had taken it out and drove it and just had a blast in it. Absolutely loved it, went to the gas station. We ran systems check on it, all the lights are working. Okay. The only caveat I tell people is this, it's an old car. Even though a lot of stuff's brand new, it's still old. So if a blinker quits work and you call me up, I either gonna walk you through how to replace the bulb or, or you can always drive up the road and say hi to us and we'll, okay. we'll fix things for you. That's, it's about the relationship after everything and knowing I appreciate that, that. Uh, everything's going great, right? This is how they always end. But the heater core puked all over the floor. <laughs> so we had to go up and pick up the car it wasn't actually the heater core, it was the uh, heater control valve itself leaked. It was, it was an original one. We had rebuilt it and put new seals in it, but for whatever reason, it decided to puke on the carpet. So we ended up replacing the carpet. Did it the next day, by the way. He, didn't, he wasn't out of his car for very long, but that's, I tell you the truth, those are the true things that happen. But the car is back in his possession, and all I ever hear from him is how much fun he's having. That makes our job worth doing all day long. Well, that and that. So that's a wrap for season. That's not a wrap. At the start of this season, I told all you people at home that I would be heavily involved. This has probably been our highest rated season. I would like to take some credit for that. I'm heavily involved upstairs now. I oversee second team work. You guys don't at home don't know what that means, but. I do. We've implemented, what was it, post-production? Oh, pre, pre-post. We implemented a thing called pre-post, so it's when they think they're done, I look it over and they're not done, and then I make it done. So really stay tuned for this next season. I got a lot of great stuff coming, a lot of great ideas. It should be amazing. Cut? Well, I mean, I don't know if I want to cut on that. Uh, I'd like to see my name at the bottom of the credits under producer and maybe Camera Boy can go back to Camera Boy, and Camera Boy 2 can go back to Audio Boy, and Audio Boy you can go back to. What'd you do before this? I mean, it's, it's a circle, but, but stay tuned, it'll be great.